Welcome to Rising Above It. I'm your host, Nancy Siegel. And today's topic is empowerment of music. Today we have a very special guest with us, and his name is John Kay. He is the lead singer and songwriter of Steppenwolf. And some of you old-time fans may remember Born to be Wild and also Magic Carpet Ride, some of the, the greatest hits ever. And he also is the founder of the Mayao K Foundation. So welcome, John. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure. And so tell us a little bit about your background. You have an extensive background and long history in the world of music, as well um, as an unusual beginning to your life. Yes, I wasn't born here. I was born in what was then part of Germany, an area known as East Prussia. Now it's a little leftover of the Soviet Union. It, uh, is a, it was uh, on the Baltic coast next to Lithuania, and that's where I was born in 44. My father, this was obviously during World War II. My father was killed in, in uh, uh, Russia a month before I was born, and with the Red Army advancing to the area that my mother and I lived in, I being a baby, uh, she took me and took a train and started going as far west as she could. As it turned out, a train came to a stop in a little tiny town because the tracks had been bombed, and she got out in the middle of the night uh, out of this train with a baby in her arms, and there was a woman there saying, you need a place to stay. And we stayed with this woman's family for almost five years. Uh, meantime, the war came to an end. Uh, uh, first, the Americans came in. This little town was called Arnstadt, a um, couple of miles from the castle where Martin Luther translated the Bible into German while he was hiding for the, from, from the church. In any event, um, after the Americans uh, had come in, well, they had a, uh, I think it was a Potsdam Agreement, whatever, the Allied forces decided the area we were in should really go to the Russians. <laughs> so the Americans left, and the Russians came in, a regiment of Cossacks. And we got stuck behind the Iron Curtain. We, uh, when I say we, my, my mother and I, I was by that time almost five. We escaped in 49 across uh, what had become the border between East Germany, communist, mm -hmm. and West Germany. Uh, but it wasn't that easy. You had to pay off some people, kind of like a coyote thing, who knew so how to get you through there. Do and, you uh, remember that? Well, okay. yes, because I had uh, a bit of a cough, and uh, I was uh, not just, uh, you know, my, it wasn't just my mother and I. Uh, the way this worked is that uh, there was sort of an underground railroad thing. You know, you knew who to go to to talk about uh, how do we do this. Well, that night when we went across, we were a group of maybe a dozen, primarily women and children. and. Um, uh, many of you know men had been killed in the war and what have you. So when they heard me cough, they said, "Now you gotta make sure you don't make any noise because when we try to get through the you know the barbed wire and the dog patrols and the you know spotlights and they had these. It wasn't as fortified then as it later became because this was '49, but they did have the towers with the lights and the machine guns and you know all that." So a couple of brothers that apparently worked for the railroad and knew the terrain, they were the ones who made the extra money on the side smuggling people through. Okay. So we did make it through, and uh, we were in a refugee camp for a day or two, immediately granted West German citizenship. They gave us, you know, 100 Deutschmarks, and hey, there you are. <laughs> you know, so so uh, we went on. at the age of five? Uh, yes, you know, and and, and, it, and at the age of five, what were you experiencing emotionally? Like, was it was basically uh, the only uh, home I had known at that point that I could remember, since I was obviously too young as a baby to have remembered the the train trip. That was all from uh, hearing that from my mother later. Mm -hmm. um, the only home, the only family that I'd, I'd had were this family that had given us shelter. They had lost three sons in the war themselves. They had a spare room. And they were sort of my granddad. And, you know, so I was, had decidedly mixed feelings because where are we going? You know, <laughs> it had been determined uh, when my mother saw that I would cry when, when there was too much sunlight. Um, she took, took me to an eye doctor and he said, well, the boy has uh, vision problems. And he hinted that perhaps one thing that might help uh, with respect to the eyes improving as I grew older 
was to have a better diet. And that was code speak for the other side of the border. Because where we were living, it was herring morning, noon, and night in food stamps. So, so that was a cue for your mother to take. Exactly. Exactly. And that was really the impetus for her to start thinking about that. And uh, so when we arrived on the other side, it, as it turned out, uh, we did have a goal, or my mother had a goal, and that was to go and find her brother, who had uh, somehow made it to West Germany, had married uh, the woman who to this day at 91 years old is still my favorite aunt. Mm -hmm. And there we um, lived uh, in this little ramshackle place he had managed to somehow secure, which he later tore down and built a nice little home, that, but that was years away. And then my mother had to uh, figure out, well, how do I make a living? She was a, uh, a good seamstress, tailor, and all that. So she left me with what were my uncle and aunt, but these pe people I didn't know. And so for the first time in my short life, I was left on with somebody strange, and she went off to what turned out to be the town of Hanover and uh, found, in fact, some work uh, amongst some people who were better off, who were not refugees like us, who had retained some of their possessions, but who, in, a, in light of the shortage of new um, uh, things being available in the stores and so on, it was still pretty short after the end of the war, they had good quality clothes that just needed to be altered to be more fashionable in, in, you know, with the current trends or what have you. So she was doing that kind of work. She came back to fetch me and we lived in a, um, an attic with a, you know, a slanted roof. Mm -hmm. We could still see where the bomb had come through and they, you know, they fixed it up. And um, there was a cold tap of water down the hall because these attics had been for the uh, domestics that lived in this fancy apartment building for the people who had these grand apartments below us. A lot of them, you know, were things had radically changed after the war but for, for numerous reasons. But that's where we lived for a while. And then my mother met a man who was uh, in, in the yard uh, together with others, uh, brick, you know, a mason laying mm -hmm. bricks, building something. There had been some stables there, and he was working on converting that to a living space. And he had managed to survive five years in a, a, a prison camp in, in Russia. And those two got on well and eventually married. And while I was, um, and then because we were a family, uh, we were entitled to one of the newer small apartments that were being rapidly built in order to accommodate some of the refugees that had streamed from the east into West Germany. Interesting. Yeah. So in those early years, um, do you feel, how do you feel that it shaped your attitude about overcoming adversity and how you deal, deal with it? Well, it shaped me uh, to a great uh, extent because I grew up in a, uh, in a, um, sit during a t uh, period, during a time where all sorts of things were making a, uh, uh, an impact on me or, or things that I noticed. Okay, there was the post-war thing of, you know, a lot of uh, uh, amputees and, pe you know, war veterans and, and, and uh, wounded people, you know. There was a lot of that. There, we, we, as children, played in the ruins where there was still live ammunition. You know, people played with uh, grenades they found and we would tear pipes out of the walls um, because the guy at the scrapyard would pay us a few pennies for copper or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was one reality. But I was also listening to the radio and, and, um, and the, uh, the people in our apartment building and some of our acquaintances and so on, the adults would vigorously discuss politics all the time because it was more or less the first real um, getting their feet wet with true democracy because the Weimar Republic, which was the first attempt at German democracy, failed because of the depression and, you know, all of that, and that brought Hitler to the rise. And, of course, under Hitler there was no, <laughs> there was right. no second opinion of yes. any kind. Um, so they were often talking about, you know, this and that point of view, and, and I listened to that, and, and that, that influenced me to some extent to, to pay attention, to hear different uh, opinions and the like. And then one day, and that was June the 17th, 1953, I was listening to a live newscast on the radio of an uprising 
in East Germany, particularly East Berlin, by a lot of people and, once again, particularly young people who were fighting Soviet tanks with Molotov cocktails and, and so on because they wanted to overthrow the communist regime. And this was before the wall in Berlin was built, many years before. And it, it was this amazing, you know, it just kind of gave you a chicken skin, you know, just goosebumps. You heard the, you know, gunfire and you heard people yelling and you heard, uh, you know, they, they were trying to throw off the yoke of totalitarianism. And how old were you at this point? I, well, in 53, I was nine years old. Okay, so yeah. at nine years old, you're hearing I was politicized. Yes. And it was further um, uh, strengthened when in 56, I think it was, I went to see a, well, actually, I went to see a movie. And, and as was uh, uh, typical in those days, a movie was preceded by a newsreel. This was before mm -hmm. the days when people, you know, later came television, but most people didn't have television. So newsreels were still part of the picture, you know. And I saw this grainy footage of the young people in Budapest, in Hungary, trying to do exactly the same thing. You know, Soviet tanks rolling through, shooting into buildings, people throwing, you know, uh, um, beer bottles full of gasoline with a piece of cloth stuck in, Molotov cocktails, you know, thrown, mm -hmm. lying under tanks and all of that. It was just astounding footage. As it turned out, many, many years later, I'm sitting in Dallas at a film festival which is showing a restored version of the film Easy Rider. Uh, in which we, we, the band, had some music and so on. Well, the cinematographer, Laszlo Kovacs, was there uh, to discuss what he had done to create uh, Easy Rider. And he and I, off camera, were talking. It turns out, and I tell him about this, I said, I remember when I saw the Hungarian uprising in 56, and I saw that grainy footage, and he says to me, I and a friend of mine, who were about 18 years old, shot that footage and smuggled it out when we escaped. Wow. So, wow, you know. What a small world. It, yeah, exactly. So, you know, in 56, I, I, politics were really interesting to me, and I, I certainly was not one who was uh, uh, particularly enamored with the communist uh, uh, approach to things. We uh, visited my stepdad's people who still lived behind the Iron Curtain prior to emigrating to Canada in 58 when things had relaxed enough where family members could go from the west to the east on a, vac you know, to, on a visit. And, mm -hmm. and then I still remember you know, being told at the farmhouse, here you could say whatever, but when you're in the village you mind your tongue because the spies are everywhere. And as it turned out later when the wall, you know, when- And that Ger was in Germany. Yeah, this was in East Germany. Okay. When the, when the Germany was finally reunited, they found out that the Stasi, the, the secret police, they had either actual plants or informers, one out of 17 people. You know, I mean, it was staggering how many spies were spying on, on their own you know, people. But anyway, so uh, growing up uh, in, in West Germany, Initially, you know, you went to a school like all the other kids uh, uh, with two shifts a day because they were, you know, they're still building schools. And so one shift went early in the morning and quit by two. The other one came along and went, and I wasn't doing well. My yeah, eyes were I was, so... I was going to ask yeah. you if, if it was challenging, especially during that time period, um, for you uh, having difficulty seeing uh, compared to all the other children that... I'm sure it had some challenges as well. It, it, it was at least uh, with respect to um, keeping up in school because uh, I couldn't read what was on the blackboard even if I sat in the first row. And the teachers were stressed out. I mean, the class sizes were 45, 50 kids twice a day. So they couldn't give a whole lot of personal attention. Well, I was falling behind rapidly. My mother, of course, was not happy about that. And she had started working uh, for various people, one of whom was a um, pediatrician. And uh, she had a good relationship with his wife. And she found out that their children went to the Free Waldorf School, the Rudolf Steiner School. And I know there's a Waldorf School here in, in Santa Barbara, in fact. And uh, that, of course, was a school banned during Hitler because their whole concepts of humanity and, you know, all of that was far, far too liberal and, you know, mm -hmm. humanitarian in, in focus. So that was suppressed. But after the war, they, they started to open schools again. 
And so one thing led to another, and, and my mother, through the good uh, um, words that the, this woman who was married to, to uh, the pediatrician put in for me uh, after school, it was private school, you had to pay, um, but there was a waiting line or whatever. I was admitted into the school, and then my life changed significantly because there the classes were smaller. There, you know, you need to be closer to the blackboard. We'll set up a little table for you over here. And um, I then sort of blossomed because I was no longer really hating school. I w mm -hmm. was looking forward to socializing with the kids and everything. And it had a great impact on me, not just because it took some stress off me, but it also... You know, their whole idea of how to educate you was vastly more friendly, so to speak, and, and, and broad-ranged. And uh, it, it, they encouraged um, having a broader view of everything, the world we were in, how we got there as a, as a uh, species, so to speak, you know, knowing where you come from. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole thing about those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it, you know, was at work there. No... You know all of the things that led up to where we are now, no matter what, you know, whether it's the Romans, mm -hmm. the Greeks, the Egyptians, whatever it is, uh, Zoroasterism, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it was also a school that said the boys and girls do gymnastics together, the boys and girls do build the garden together, they do everything together. Because, you know, the boys will have to learn how to sew, and the girls are going to have to learn how to chop wood into something that looks like a figure, you know. And it was just a whole different approach. And, and that um, left a mark on me that I was far more aware when I was much older than I was at the time. But the real thing that set me off was when uh, a kid in that school who was uh, predisposed to tinkering with electronics and stuff, he had, built, he, had a, he had a cigar box, literally a cigar box, and he put a few devices in there that are still a mystery to me. And in it, he had plugged a, an old, he found it somewhere, um, what, what the radio man in the tank would wear, just a single uh, uh, cup over one ear, not a whole headset, just okay. one. Okay. And I could take that thing and stick it into the box spring underneath the bed I was sleeping in and put that cup under, you know, on the pillow. So if I was lying on it, if my mother came, it looked like I was sleeping. But I was really doing this. I was dialing for some of the cool radio stations like Radio Luxembourg. And that's where I found rock and roll. That's where I discovered initially Elvis, Little Richard, people like that. And then later came the American Armed Forces Radio Network that I discovered somehow. And there you could get this stuff all the time. That and, started And that started your interest in music. Exactly. And what was your first interest in music? You said you mentioned Little Richard. Um, well, my, the, you know, um, the power of music uh, was something that came actually as an experience preceding, uh, you know, that, that wild abandon of, of, of rock and roll. I don't know really why, but my mother had some tickets for a concert, which took place in a, in a church because it you know, had great acoustics and all that, of uh, the Don Cossack Choir, um, which you know, all male uh, Cossack choir, it must have been 35 of these men. And um, well, I don't know, a few, few songs into this concert, I started to weep uh, quite... Um, and my mother was a little concerned and all of that, but when we talked about it, and I had to try and explain it later again, much later when I had a better grip on these kind of things as to what's at work there, the, the, first of all, the sound was fantastic in this, in, in this church, but the songs were, some of them, you know, very old, and they embodied some of the most you know, intense human suffering that had led to the creation of these songs. And so even though I didn't speak a word of Russian and still don't, just those melodies and just the passion which, which they were um, uh, performed, it was like a, a laser that goes to your very core mm -hmm. and, and it triggers something that, particularly at that young age, I might have been, I don't know, 9, 10, uh, that you can't really explain, but it connected. And that was the first sort of aha moment. When Little Richard came along and Elvis and, you know, numerous others, that's when I got chicken skin. You know, that okay. was like, again, I didn't understand any of it. What is that? You know, I, um, 
what indeed does a Wapapaluma Alambang do <laughs> mean, you know? But then you there, found out later. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were a couple of movies that finally came over from the okay. states. One of them was called "Don't Knock the Rock," and I saw Little Richard on the piano with the big band and everything. I was, like, I was just spellbound, and so that's when I developed at age twelve or so this this childhood daydream fantasy. You know, when you're at that age, you mm -hmm. you can conjure up any scenario irrespective of how absurd it may be to, to an adult. So, <laughs> yeah, sure, you know, someday I'll be on the other side of the ocean where that stuff comes from, and I'm going to learn how to speak English, and I'm going to do that. And, and so you did. <laughs> uh, you came over to Canada, right. uh, Toronto, and uh, you, h how did you learn English? Like, well, was it through school or was it on your Yeah, school? we had English in school, but, you know, it's basically recite the vocabulary and a few sentences. Okay. And, you know, you, you pay enough attention to get your marks that are adequate, but, you know, your focus is on other things. So when I got there, that's really when I learned how, how ill-prepared I was in, in the l English language uh, department. And I arrived in March. Uh, my 14th birthday was in April. Uh, they put me into a high school. And um, now I had the same thing again. I couldn't read the blackboard. On top of that, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Um, so two things happened. They pulled me out of there and put me into the CNIB, the Can Canadian National Institute for the Blind, sight-saving classes. These are classes not for the totally blind, but for those who have you know, some vision. Mm -hmm. And that sort of took the pressure off of, of having to immediately, you know, keep up with everybody else. Um, that was helpful. But what was really kind of kick-starting me in the English uh, department was that during the long summer vacation, which started in May and lasted till after Labor Day or whatever, it was unheard of. In, in Germany, it was six weeks, and back, nose to the grindstone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I had this entire summer, no friends, and the radio was my friend because... I could not believe all the things I could get on it. There was rock and roll on a, 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 FM was like a non-starter. There was like an occasional station with classical music. The mm -hmm. very thing that they crammed down my throat in Germany I wanted to get away from. <laughs> so I was on the AM dial, and we were 100 miles from Buffalo, and there were tons of black stations and uh, Sunday morning black church gospel things and so forth. I went nuts. But along with that came the speed rapping, as we say these days, DJs talking a mile a minute, yada, you know, mm -hmm. yada. So after a while, that was, if I wanted to know what was going on, I had to really pay attention. What are they saying? Right? Look up a few words, this and that. And finally, by the time the first summer vacation was behind me, I was able to at least talk to some of my peers in sight saving classes and gradually, and we had a great, in, from England, English. Um, woman, uh, uh, English teacher, and she knew, you know, that I needed a little bit, and, and she kind of helped me along as well. And between those two sources, I'd say a year after my arrival, I was doing pretty good. That's good. And uh, you learned, w at what age did you learn to play instruments? Well, actually, that And actually, were you, when you started getting into the actual formation of the band or, or Yeah, playing. that was some time away, but uh, but uh, I definitely, uh, <laughs> bef uh, I had seen a film with, with Elvis in it. I might have been loving you, I'm not sure. Or I'd seen a photo of him, and he had this, um, this big Gibson acoustic guitar. My stepdad, who was handy with his hands, tried to build me one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, by that time, we were ready to immigrate, so he left his incomplete guitar uh, behind. When, when we were in, in Toronto, I would you know, um, look around in, at the music stores, but all the instruments were really expensive. So eventually I came across a K guitar for $52, which back then was a week's wage for, you know, for, for working people and um, quite a bit of money. So somehow I managed to, my mother always said, well, your father uh, was self-taught and he played a little violin and some accordion and you must have maybe gotten some of your musical abilities, whatever they may be, from him. So she was predisposed to maybe give me a little help along the, the way. And I don't know what kind of a deal we made, made that I would forgo my paltry allowance for the next five years or something. <laughs> but anyway, she um, financed the purchase of this guitar. 
Uh, but the problem is, what do I do with it? You know, I mean, what, what do you, where do you put your fingers? What do you do with it? I didn't have anybody to teach me. Um, and that's where a friend, um, who's still my friend to this day, he's by now totally blind, one of Canada's best blind skiers, goes sailing with his blind wife and their sighted sons, great guy. Stan King was his name. He gave me a, a, um, a, a Hank Williams songbook. And he said, don't worry about all those notes on there. What you want to look at are these funny little diagrams. Those are chord diagrams. That's those, those little lines, those are strings. Those are little bumps on there, those are your fingers. That's where you put them. I said, oh, wow. It wasn't easy, but once I you know, made this claw thing and went bring, oh. So I could strum this while I sing. Oh, that's OK. So after a while, I knew maybe six chords, three in two different keys. Mm -hmm. And I realized that you know, country songs, a lot of folk songs, some rock and roll songs, that, that's all you really needed in order to. Just a few you know, chords. And meantime, the CNIB, I said, well, the boy can't see too well, so we got to give him something to get to play some talking books on, which came back in those days in the form of reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Mm -hmm. So they loaned me this woolen sack tape recorder. And of course, the first thing I went out was about a reel of blank tape, because the thing came with a tiny little microphone. And I put that blank tape on there and got my guitar and started. And that's when I almost quit, because like most people, when you hear your own voice played back uh, for the first time, <laughs> you, don't you go, like it. that's yeah. not me. You know, that can't possibly, am I that bad? You know, so, but the ego overcame the disappointment. And so, well, you better keep, keep practicing, you know. And so, what, what I would do at that time, uh, I found one other kindred soul in the school I was attending. And he was pretty good on the piano. And he played in a local little band. He said, well, the guys you really want to see, they play here regularly. They turn out later to be the band that backed up Dylan and you know, could tell you all sorts of things about them. But in any case, they would play Saturday afternoon matinees that permitted underage, meaning under 21, kids to go and see them play at this bar, at this, at this nightclub. Um, and that's where we went. And that's where we saw the real deal. That's where we kind of learned from, wow, this a, a, you know, a really good band sounds like this. And lots of uh, young upstart amateur musicians in Toronto got their cues from, uh, it was actually Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks. Ronnie Hawkins was originally from the Delta in, in Arkansas. And he, together with some Canadian guys, you know, uh, put together this, this amazing band, which had a long his, uh, you know, uh, career thereafter. But um, th those were my only exposure, that and listening to the radio and trying to once I was able to get a few records, buy a few records, put the needle on over and over mm -hmm. and over and again the same spot. And just you know, stuck and, to and it. And try to train the, the ear because... The power of perseverance. <laughs> exactly. If you want it bad enough, yeah. you know, keep, keep sticking with That's it. That's great. Um, the adversity that you experienced from childhood, um, how did that influence your writing style and, your, and, the, and the lyrics that you write? I, you know, the sort of... Uh, political exposure and those kind of things. Um, it, it, um, it, in a roundabout way, it addresses the question you asked. Because when I was still in Hanover, um, I stumbled across something called the America House. And that was, uh, you know, in, in, in the process, this was part of the Marshall Plan, which, you know, uh, was one of the, the most brilliant things the United States ever did, and certainly that the government ever did, which is to turn the former enemy, namely Germany, into an ally and a trading partner by fostering the, de the democratization of the country and by you know, helping it get on its feet again. But in order to, to uh, plant the seeds of a true democracy deeply, they wanted to make sure that Nazi, you know, fascism wouldn't rear its ugly head again and so forth. So they had these cultural centers, America houses. In it, you could uh, see movies about America, from America. Uh, and, they were th and, and I would go, and it was free. So I would go there and I would see all these, you know, I, yeah, I would go to, you know, to a movie house to pay to see John Wayne or uh, whoever, you know, Hollywood movies. But in America House, I learned about America, including the Constitution and other things. And, uh, uh, and, and that resonated with me because of the communist thing and, you know, all these other things. I said, 
not only is their uh, music and their movies really cool, but they, are, you know, I like this. Well, when I came to Canada, we had access to the Buffalo, New York television ch channels and, and uh, um, you know, radio uh, channels as well. And that's when I saw um, the bulldogs of, uh, uh, not the bulldogs, but the uh, police dogs of Bull Connor, you know, in Birmingham with the fire hoses, um, uh, you know, uh, going after civil rights demonstrators. And I remember sitting next to the 80-plus-year-old uh, a uh, Ukrainian immigrant who was our landlord from Flatwe, and you know, and I was a young fellow, and we both looked at each other. We both had tears in our eyes, and he, in his broken English, was going, "Why do they hate these people like this?" You know, he was totally you couldn't, you know, and I couldn't really get it either because I was thinking, "That's not really the America I learned about." You know, I mean, it was very, it was its ugly side. Mm -hmm. You know, its intolerant side. Uh, so when. Um, when I, uh, some, when later down the line, when I was a little older, you know, I had my guitar. I started to play a few songs, mimicking the songs uh, by people whose music I uh, uh, admired and enjoyed. Some rock and roll, R and B, you know, country, whatever, whatever. Country I liked often because the lyrics had, in certain songs, uh, content that story songs that I liked. But uh, here's the thing: as time went on. Um, uh, by the time I was almost done with Canadian high school, uh, all of a sudden, you know, rock and roll had lost its its punch, and a different type of music started to become very popular, and that was the resurgence of American folk music. And all of a sudden, people like Dylan and, and Richard Ferrigno and Phil Oakes and Tom Paxton and numerous others were following the footsteps of uh, Woody Guthrie and the Weavers and others. I mean, com the commercial successes were Peter, Paul, and Mary, the Kingston Tree, and so on. But these young writers, Buffy St. Maria was another one, they had a point of view and expressed their concerns and, uh, you know, a lot of people called them protest songs. Within the folk community, they were called topical songs. Later, I went, went uh, once we, you know, graduated high school and moved to uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, I would go down to the Newport, Rhode Island Folk Festival. And there, all of a sudden, I was one of tens of thousands of young people my age listening to our own age group, as exemplified by Dylan and the like, singing about the here and now, about slowly the, the Vietnam War became an issue because of the draft. The civil rights thing was by, by no means over yet, you know, it was still the struggle. And that's where um, my po politicized, you know, the fact that I had been exposed to political things and, and so on, uh, that was something where, you know, you talk about adversity. Well, the, the civil rights movement was all about overcoming huge adversity. and, mm -hmm. and um, for various reasons that I won't even bother to try and analyze too deeply right now, but I had always had a, uh, uh, there was an internal rage that came to light every time I saw some sort of injustice, you know, because I don't know whether it was because of identifying with the underdog, um, but when I saw those things, not to mention the fact that many of my um, rock and roll R&B heroes were black, you know. Um, and, and some of the things I saw on TV were just, you know, you wanted to put your thro foot through the tube. I mean, I, was, I, I would just become... So to me, these were the people who uh, I admired because, uh, you know, many years later, I met John Sigenthaler in Tennessee, uh, who was working for Bobby Kennedy and was one of the freedom writers with, uh, you know, John Lewis and others, and, you know, who went down into the South and came straight off the bus and got a brick in the head and went straight to the, you know, uh, into the hospital, people who put their life on the line. And so, you know, whenever I see, whether it's the Mandelas of the world or when I see people with that kind of courage to face these horrendous uh, obstacles and, and uh, adversity, um, that's where, you know, the, there's a part of me that, that um, is somehow connected to that. I don't know whether because of my background I tend to gravitate towards that. I feel particularly strongly uh, mm -hmm. about those things. But, um, uh, you know, the one thing that, I, that was not really, um, uh, I don't want to say uh, um, 
countenance, but certainly, uh, you know, people later down said, well, you know, you lost your dad and you escaped from communism and your eyes weren't, uh, aren't very good. And, you know, you had a lot to deal with. And uh, yeah, but it's all relative, you know, because when we did make it to West Germany and you saw everybody else, the, the usually unspoken, occasionally hinted at message was, look, we all got something to deal with here. Get on with it. You know, because uh, self-pity and wringing your hands or, you know, there's only so much sympathy to go around. Everybody's got something, you know. It's like in the book uh, uh, Steppenwolf where he says, you know, everybody's got their, their, their loss to deal with and none of them are easy, you know. So, mm -hmm. so th that your childhood, uh, you know, deeply influenced your uh, songwriting. And... In what, what ways, uh, you shared with me earlier uh, the, the fans that have written to you about your music and how it influenced them and helped them to overcome their adversities and their challenges in life and gave them some direction. Well, you know, you, you sit there in the corner with a guitar and you write something, you keep, you know, uh, messing about with it and until you're tinkering, until, I mean, I've written some songs that, that one's not going to see the light of day. But most of the time, you keep at it until you come up with something and say, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. It, it reflects what, what I wanted to say, and it sounds, you know. So you send it out there. Uh, you send it out there if you're lucky enough to have a recording contract. Well, of course, uh, later down the line, we did, we the band. Mm -hmm. um, as to what it does out there, you really don't uh, quite know. When you perform it on stage, you try to use the response to songs as a barometer reading as to did it connect, does it resonate, and so on. But in our case, um, and I, I'm sure this is by no means unique, it's a fairly common experience, we didn't really um, have a, an idea of what the music might um, do out there until uh, some time later, because when we, when we first, and now I'm talking about Steppenwolf, when we first became successful, and, and by the way, to quickly get to that, what, what, uh, what happened um, uh, when I lived for a year in Buffalo, I, you know, because of the eyes, I couldn't get any employment. I worked for the Buffalo Association of the Blind in a candle factory for 75 cents an hour, and, you know, and I said, this is not my future, and I just kept playing guitar, playing in folk clubs, learning from those who had something to offer. Um, then with a friend of mine from Toronto, he had a nice open TR3 Triumph. We went to California, mm -hmm. and when I came back from that, I said, I want to be in California. There you go. The beaches, the sun, the girls, you know, we'll go there. <laughs> so that's where I wound up. At that point in Los Angeles, the folk music thing was really doing well. There was the Troubadour, there were several other clubs. And so I got to hang out at the Troubadour. Doug Weston, who owned it, eventually gave me, my kid, you're always hanging around. You want to have a job at the box office, whatever. So I would do that, and I would listen to those who I admired playing. Well, for various reasons, a year later, there was girlfriend trouble, this and that. I grabbed my guitar and hitchhiked back east to kind of visit my old stomping ground. And that's where, in Toronto, Canada, I met the Canadian band, The Sparrows, which had gone through some member changes. They heard me play at a club next door. We sat in with one another, and we liked the combined sound. And um, the, the Sparrows, as they were called then, got a deal with Columbia Records. We moved to New York. We recorded some tracks. None of them went anywhere. And I kept pestering them. I said, man, where it's going on is in California. I saw, I played with some of the guys who wound up being in the birds. And, you know, there's stuff going on there. Right now, New York is kind of sort of treading water. We need to go out there. Eventually we did. And so uh, after playing at the Whiskey and, you know, uh, as the Sparrows and some other Sunset Street clubs, then came what uh, uh, Buffalo Springfield sang about uh, uh, for, uh, for what, what, what was it, for what it's worth, yeah. When the so-called Sunset Strip riots took place between the hippies and the LAPD mm -hmm. that shut down the clubs, we were pushed, well, we have to place somewhere. We wound up in um, the Bay Area and we were welcomed there. We met people who liked what we did. We played the Avalon Ballroom and other things and we were for less than a year a Bay Area band. We were part of that whole first human being thing, not playing but observing in Panhandle Park and saw that whole Haight-Ashbury thing blossom and so on. But the label didn't 
you know, said, well, these guys have history, so they let us out of the recording contract. And after one more gig on the Sunset Strip, um, the band busted up, and now what? Well, um, I had met in the meantime in Toronto uh, a young woman I was really quite fond of. We had moved in together. In fact, I had followed her home the same night I met her and moved <laughs> in with her. And, um, and she she's, got her. She's a beautiful woman. What's that? <laughs> and she's a beautiful woman. Yeah, she, she, yeah. We've been partners ever since. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she got her immigration visa based on uh, my affidavit that we would get married, and the INS said, all right, then, within 10 days of her arrival, you must get married, or otherwise it's out of here. So we went downtown and for five bucks did that. Um, and she, though, on the other hand, had a girlfriend also from Toronto who had also come to L.A. and just gotten married as well to a fellow by the name of Gabrielle Meckler who happened to be a record producer. And they moved in next door to this little crackerjack box, that apartment we were above the double gar garage. And we got to talk, and Gabrielle and I, one thing led to another and said, well, you know, these tapes from the Sparrow, that sounds pretty good. You, are any of these guys still around? I said, yeah, the drummer lives down down the street with his girlfriend. You know, it's the old joke about what do you call a musician um, without a girlfriend? Homeless. Well, <laughs> Jerry found, you know, a girlfriend. He was living with her. The organist had a girlfriend from San Francisco that followed him down. He was living with her. They, the girlfriends were working. We were looking for a job. So he said, well, why don't you get them? And, and uh, you know, a couple of other guys. There was a young, uh, he was 17, guitar player that had been you know, around the sparrows, we called him. He was, he was um, into it, and then we put a, a, a note up at the bulletin board, in Wallach's Music City, for a bass player. And this guy showed up, looked like a gypsy with a, you know, but great player. Anyway, that was the lineup. And we rehearsed in this little garage. We were truly a garage band, and eventually Gabrielle says, "Let's do some demos." That thing led to a recording contract with uh, ABC Dunhill, and so then. Um, uh, within a year or so, we had our first album recorded, and it, it was released. During that process, prior to that, by the way, I had, this was during the year I was in uh, Los Angeles doing my folk thing. The Birds had finally formed, had recorded for Columbia. They were playing at what is now on Sunset Strip, the comedy store, which back then was still Ciro's. Or, or, yeah, it was Ciro's. And we would go there to hear them play. And that's when Dylan came by and sat in with them. But the thing that I took away from that was, wait a second, these are, many of these are Dylan songs that are very specific about social, political issues. Mm -hmm. And these guys, the birds, have set them to electric music. And this works really well. Because uh, when I had been at the Newport Folk Festival and attending the so-called topical work, uh, uh, the topical song workshops with Dylan and others, the one thing that I sensed was a, a sense of community. There were tens of thousands of other young, like-minded people. And all of us, when we went home, we knew we were no longer alone. So that was an important discovery because from that time on, I carried with me the knowledge that one can express what's going on and what you're concerned with and what your issues are in music. And it doesn't have to be just, you know, a dulcimer and a banjo or whatever. The birds did that with electric. And so when Stephen Wolf came to be and some of the songs that I wrote for the first and subsequent albums, they would at times have uh, lyric content that went beyond just the danceable songs. And from, and, and that never abated. It was always like, okay, there are certain songs that, you know, the, the white 16-year-old girls that were in the Ed Sullivan show, you know, loved us for. But those who bought our albums knew there was a lot more meat and potatoes, you know, musically Substance. than just that. Yes. Okay. So uh, we have about 15 minutes left in the show. Um, well, I'd like to touch on... on what happened in the 70s, right. and and then we'll move forward with the uh, your foundation, and I want to sure. share that with the audience yeah. as well. Uh, so in the 70s, uh, the band separated, right. and then it reunited in the mid 70s, right. and then again retired in the 76. Yeah, it got it got involved. I yeah. had burned out. Uh, we had a recording agreement that required two albums a year. 
Um, <clears throat> I was the primary songwriter, this and that. I didn't want the responsibility, you know, and I, I had a, a young daughter growing up and everything else. So I just said, hey, guys, we need to go our separate ways. I, I need a breather, need to re recharge the batteries. That's when we, uh, Sam Yorty declared it Steppenwolf Day in L.A., and we, you know, officially mm -hmm. broke up. Um, however, uh, something came to pass a couple of years later, roughly, when um, somebody came over to talk to our management company about a different act they were representing, and they said, and by the way, if Steppenwolf was willing to do a European farewell tour, I got all sorts of dates lined up, you know, Royal Albert Hall in London and all of these things. And I said, well, Steppenwolf doesn't really exist, but I'm doing a solo thing. If you let me open for Steppenwolf so I can kind of promote my own thing, fine. So that's what we did. Well, during the process of doing that, everybody says, you know, this time away from one another really was doing us good. We're all more enthused and energetic. Anybody care to try it again when we come home to reunite? And that's what we did. Now, unfortunately, because of label problems in 76 and so forth, things, we kind of ran into a brick wall. And um, so, you know, we went our separate ways in 76. And I kind of went with my wife and daughter in our little van, and we went just getting to know each other again for months, you know, all over the Southwest and in Hawaii and so on. Uh, but while that was going on, and I signed a deal with Mercury Records for a solo album, all of a sudden we heard there were Steppenwolf bands, not one, several out there. And it turned out that a couple of ex-members of ours that had been let go, as I like to say, for conduct even unbecoming a rock and roll <laughs> musician. <laughs> That's uh, hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, they were out there, you know, trashing the name, not because they meant to destroy it, but because... Uh, they, you know, they were uh, needed to make money, and uh, they they were out there. But unfortunately, um, they were not accepted with open arms by the public because a lot of it was, well, where's the frontman? Where's the singer? Where's the songwriter, John? Where, where's he? Well, you know, so things got very ugly, and they were in a death spiral. And you know, from legitimate venues, they wound up, you know, in in the toilet club circuit of, 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 and that didn't sit well with me at all, nor Jerry, the original drummer with whom I was still, you know, partners and friends. So, uh, yeah, we engaged our lawyers and the, you know, but the political, I mean, the uh, the legal system is, is very slow. So out of sheer frustration in 1980, I went on the road as John K. and Stephen Wolf to directly compete with those that, you know, and of course, our fan base knew the history well enough to know who I am and mm -hmm. if my name was in front, oh, so that's John with these guys, okay. So we slowly worked our way, and I mean it was grinding and grueling, it took years. But we did get it done, and that's where you learn about overcoming adversity because every, it was one of those things where, you know, okay, you were in one of these miserable clubs you wouldn't enter without a whip in a chair, and you're on stage playing to 300 people, that's all that fit in there. Mm -hmm. And you have to tell yourself, Forget about having played, you know, arenas just a couple of years ago. This is what it is. So you either throw in the towel or you send every one of these people home smiling and let them tell others, man, you missed a really good show. And if you keep, that, keep doing that often enough, you should be able to, it should build. And that's what mm -hmm. it did. It took, took several years, but it did. And in the process, we learned to, how to do our own, what we call, wolf world. We had our own merchandise company, our recording studio, music publishing companies, a tour bus, a truck, 105 cases of gear, and on and on and on. But that went over a number of years. And during that period, you kind of learn to grit your teeth and get through the really rough spots. And then slowly, as things started looking up for you again, that too wound up in the lyrics that you write about overcoming. Hold on, never give up, never give in. You know, uh, all of those things. And the music often went out there, and then the letters came, and the emails, and letters that are in a shoebox, the really special ones. And they, along with the family photo albums, would be the first thing to grab if there was a fire in the house. Mm -hmm. Because you reach somebody at a point in their life when that certain song, that certain lyric, got them over that speed bump. I mean, I have letters of people who swear up and down that night suicide was planned and that song uh, feed the fire um, and others you know was the difference of letting it go for one more day you know that's where the power I sensed as an eight-year-old uh, and the power that you hear in songs like Sarah uh, uh, Laughlin's Angel and other songs mm -hmm. where you know you that's where it goes to your very core 
that's not what we set out to do. It's just that our own experiences fostered the writing of some songs that at times affected others in a positive way. Which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and probably very gratifying, I can only assume. It's more rewarding than the gold records. Yeah, that's great. So let's, um, we have a few minutes left. Um, let's talk about your foundation. And um, should we show the clip? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, the gotta, uh, introduction got, clip will yeah. sort of say it okay. best. If we can roll that. Um, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that while they get that set up. Yeah, this is when you go to our foundation's little YouTube channel. Uh, you will find this clip, which basically is me explaining uh, what we do. Okay. And they're going to be bringing that up in a moment. Okay. So. It's, uh, it's not very long. It's about four minutes. And, uh, you know, the foundation was uh, formed because... <laughs> Welcome to the Maokei Foundation's YouTube channel. The main focus of our foundation is the protection of wildlife, the environment, and human rights. You can find more information about our mission and activities at our website, maokei.org. There you'll find lots of images and descriptions about our various projects. And should you find our efforts worthy of your support, we'll gladly and gratefully accept your donations. However, our secondary mission is to spread the word about the inspiring work and people we've seen and met in our travels. The many documentaries on this channel were created for that purpose, and it's our hope that these videos will motivate some viewers to directly support the featured organizations. Okay, we're having technical problems with the, with the clip. Maybe we can bring up the... Uh, well, we can talk about it a little bit, you yeah. know, in case this one doesn't come to life. Right. Um, my wife and I, you know, by the way, prior to this, thing, uh, this foundation ever being formed, uh, out of the corner of your eyes, even though you're self-focused when you're up on stage and you're pursuing your career, you know, you see others who really are about the other, you know, and some of them performers, you know, the Bonnie Rates of the world and, and many others. Uh, so it's not as though I was oblivious to that sort of thing, but in our uh, touring, uh, or rather travels around the world uh, that my wife and I did, we came into, uh, into contact with certain situations that really kind of awakened uh, me to some extent. And since uh, we had already uh, reached the mountaintop again, you know, with what the wolf was doing, I thought, well, it's long overdue that we applied ourselves to the benefit of those things that, that we feel are important to support and who are doing uh, really uh, important work uh, that always needs more help and assistance. So uh, when, you know, we had been like everybody else, meaning uh, private citizens, you know, making donations and all of that, and our financial gurus at one point said, you know, if you're going to do this regularly, if you set up in a, a foundation, um, that would be a better way to do it for a variety of reasons. So they helped us put that together. And one of the first things that we uh, did was to build the school in Cambodia with, through the uh, assistance of American Assistance for Cambodia, an uh, organization that was uh, run by Bernie Krischer, an American who uh, lives in Tokyo. And that was our first uh, project. Uh, but we also uh, had uh, decided that the mission of the uh, foundation would be threefold. Uh, wildlife protection, conservation issues, and human rights issues. Well, the school to us is a human right. Basic education is a human right. So that uh, was our first project. In the years since then, we have gotten more and more involved, particularly in Kenya, um, and Tanzania and so on, with uh, issues that pertain to wildlife protection. Poaching is rampant uh, once again in Africa. It's horrific for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, habitat loss, of course, continues to uh, be a problem because of, you know, whatever it is, palm oil plantations in Indonesia, a um, variety of problems. And there are those on the ground doing great work to try to combat it. And mm -hmm. we try to promote, uh, you know, support them. Okay. And uh, besides the school for Cam uh, Cambodia, in Cam Cambodia, right. uh, the, uh, the, you have a foundation for the elephants as well. Well, we support certain elephant-focused 
entities, one of which, uh, one of the, there, there, there are a couple I can think of right off the bat. One of them is the, um, uh, the elephant uh, uh, chess, the elephant sanctuary in Hornwell, Tennessee. Uh, you can see what they do by simply going to literally elephants.com. Okay. And they rescue um, uh, circus and, and zoo elephants, often abused, neglected, sick, injured, old, uh, who get to live out their lives uh, on 2,700 acres in the hills of Tennessee without any human disturbances or, or, or uh, visitors. They get to live like elephants amongst themselves. Um, in fact, my, my daughter worked for them, taking care of three African elephants for a while. Um, however, uh, someone who is doing equally, if perhaps in the long term, not even more important work, is the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Nairobi, Kenya, which has, ever since David's uh, premature death, his wife, Dame Daphne uh, Sheldrick, she's, you know, Dame of the Realm, English Queen and all that, she has for over 30 years, or almost 40 years, uh, together with numerous assistants, and, and now more recently her daughter uh, Angela and so on, uh, rescued uh, orphaned baby elephants, which because of her constant uh, experimenting with finding a elephant milk substitute that the little ones would thrive on, she has managed at this point to rescue, uh, raise, and reintroduce into the wild you know, something like 200 elephants. And it's an incredibly painstaking, demanding job because they have to be uh, accompanied uh, around the clock, fed huge, huge amounts of, you know, three bottles the size at each sitting every four hours. Um, <clears throat> they're milk dependent for over three years. Uh, and these little orphans form their own little mini herds with their own mini matriarchs and mm -hmm. it's just astounding to watch. We were there in, in uh, November again and uh, flew up to Savo uh, National Park where some of the graduates who are gr old enough to graduate from the nursery are slowly being reintroduced into the wild and um, you know we, we f I mean we have a special sp uh, uh, spot in our heart for, for elephants. The more we learn about how sensitive uh, and, and intelligent these uh, amazing creatures are the more we, you know, and poaching has just become incredibly yeah. rampant. Where can people go to find out more? Can you, you can, your yeah, website? there's a couple of ways you can go about, uh, you know, either um, assist, if you can donate or contribute to the Maui K Foundation Which at Maui K. Yeah. Yeah. O R G. M A U E K A Y O R G. There's also a YouTube channel that we have, which is predictably youtube.com forward slash Maui K, all one string. And there you'll see some of the, the video clips that are about the things we just talked about. Um, and, you know, or if you see those clips, you will see at the end of each one of them the website and the name okay, of the yeah. entity that we support, and okay. you can go there directly. Thank you, John. Thank Great. you for being here today. And remember, if life gets you down, you hold the power to keep rising above it. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Okay. And you said, right.